although uh, Priscilla is going to a very dangerous place, um, I believe God's hand will protect her. And if she's to die as a martyr, I can't stand in God's way. So we can't stop her. But she's determined to serve the Lord, so we'll let her serve the Lord where God leads her. Amen? Praise God. Sunday school is dismissed at this time. <laughs> Anyone have a testimony? Do you have a song, by the way, today? Alicia, do you have a song? No? You have a testimony? Come on. Praise the Lord, everybody. I just want to give honor to God and praise to his holy name. I thank God for allowing me to be here because yesterday... Uh, my husband was working on my car, and then he told me to bend down and look and see what the problem was. So I bend down. I caught on to the vehicle, and I bend down. I couldn't get back up. I had to pull myself back up. And then I couldn't hardly walk. So then I needed to get up. After he fixed it, I needed to get an oil chain. So I went to get the oil chain. I couldn't hardly walk. And then I came back when it got through the oil chains. When I got home, I barely could get out the car, so I got in the bed, and I text Sister Linda and told her to ask Pastor and her to pray for me, and I text my son and my daughter, and I said, y'all pray for me because I, I cannot hardly walk. Then as we began to pray, God came. He met us. Deliverance came because if deliverance hadn't came, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be able to walk. I can move, I can jump, I can leap. Hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah! Hey! Hallelujah! He's wonderful! Ha. Oh, glory! I just thank God. Thank God. Thank God for moving on my behalf. Thank you. Hallelujah. That's how you give a testimony. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you get excited when God touches you. I want you to know, it, it's something when your back goes out. My back went out. I remember just reaching in my trunk, and I fell to my knees right there in the driveway. I couldn't get up. I said, that's painful. And when God does that, when God gives you that miracle, see, the Bible says if two of you agree as touching anything, it shall be done. But you've got to have faith. Come on. We want to trust in the doctor and the chiropractor and all that stuff. and That's good in, in, in its time and when it has to be. But God can do it just like that. Amen? Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles with you, please, we want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. If you think we're kind of crazy, we are. If you think we're kind of nuts, we are. If you think we're Pentecostal, we are. Hallelujah. I'm not Baptist. I'm Pentecostal. I believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is going to move on your life like never before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to know, I have visible signs of my prayers being answered. How about you? You got visible? How many got visible signs? You see some visible signs that God answers prayer. I'm telling you, I see it. Hallelujah. And God's going to do more. Hallelujah. 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 I, I, I see. I, I see in the spirit tonight, this morning. God's going to do some great things. Hallelujah. I'm sitting here getting ready to preach, and the Lord told me to tell Carolyn that you're going to be on fire for Jesus. No, 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 not yet. You got, you got the flame. You ain't on fire. Fire is consuming. You go watch a fire on a building. It starts out small, but then it consumes. He's going to consume you. But you're going to fight. The Bible says the flesh warreth against the spirit. Whatever the spirit wants to do, the flesh always fights it. You're in a battle 24-7 whether you know it or not. And the enemy wants to see you destroyed. The enemy wants to see you give up. The enemy wants to see you lying in bed. 
and, 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 and suffering and pain and all those kind of things. But God, I said, but God, but God, hallelujah. When we put our faith together with what God's word says, we can see miracles. When we put our faith with what God says, we can see divine miracles. We can see the Lord moving in the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 3. I'm going to start with verse 17 this morning. I don't have no introductions today. I don't have any movies on the screen. I don't have anything fancy. God said, don't do nothing fancy today. Just let it fly. I'm letting it fly. When Annie said that scripture this morning, my hair on the back of my head, whatever I have left, stood up. Ooh, Lord, you wanted to say that this morning. Verse 17 says, Ye therefore, meaning everyone that he was speaking to, Beloved, seeing you have, you know these things before, beware. 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 I'm going to say it again. Beware. Lest you also say, that's me. Oh, come on. That's weak. Say, that's me. Be also led away with the error of the wicked. Who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. He's talking to the church. He's talking to Christians. And he's telling them, he says, I want you to please know these things before that you know. Beware. Beware. Watch out. Now, why would he tell Christians to watch out if Christians were protected? Why would he tell you to beware lest you also be led away with the error of the wicked. Let me ask you a question. If I asked you this question, who are the wicked, what would you say? You would probably say it's probably some of the prostitutes down on Wells Square. You probably say it's some of the alcoholics that are in the uh, in the care centers. Or you probably would say it's the drug addict that's hung over and needs a fix this morning. But here the wicked means this. One led astray from the right way. Are you hearing me this morning? It means one who has been led astray from the right way. So there's a right way and there's a wrong way, right? If there's a right way, there has to be a wrong way. And what is that wrong way? Error can be wrong in opinion, related to moral or religious issues. Which shows itself in action, a wrong mode of acting, that which leads into error, deceit, or fraud. That's error. It's one who is led in error. The wicked is one who breaks through the resistance of law and gratifies his or her lusts or desires. When you and I become a Christian, I am, I, I, I've got to just tell you, I'm sick and tired of hearing these preachers on the, on the radio and on, on TV. 
I'm, I'm, I'm just tired of seeing people come to Jesus without repentance. Sounds like this. Close your eyes. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord, I receive you now as my Savior. Thank you. You love me. You care for me. In Jesus' name. That person is about as saved as a hot dog on a wet bun. Hello. Are you hearing me? You can say the words all you want to, but unless you repent. What it means to repent is to turn from the direction you're going to the direction that the Lord has for you. Unless you're willing to repent of your sin and turn from your sin, you are not saved. You can think you're saved. You can think church saves you or the Bible saves you. Or you can think you're saved simply because you simply believe. Let me ask you the question. How many here would say that the devil's saved? How many believe the devil's saved? Anybody believe that? Raise your hand. Is the devil saved? Well, shout it out. Tell me. The devil's not saved? No, the Bible says he believes. The Bible says the devil believes and trembles. So believing doesn't make you saved. What makes you saved is when you repent of your sin. When you turn from your sins and you accept Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross for you. And this is a word that the, today's church don't like. It's called sanctification. Don't like that word. What does it mean? It means that you're turning over those areas of your life that are still a stench in God's nostrils. Your ways are not his ways. Your thoughts are not his thoughts. For his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways higher than our ways. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led astray with the error of the wicked, fall. Say the word with me, fall. From your own steadfastness. A Christian who believes or thinks he cannot fall is lying in pride and arrogance. A person who says, oh, that will never happen to me, get ready. Oh, I will never do that. Get ready. Oh, I would never say that. Get ready. Because the devil roams like a roaring lion throughout the entire earth. Are you listening to me this morning? Are you being distracted? Because that's what the devil wants. He wants you to be distracted. He doesn't want you to pay attention. Why? Why? Because he's fighting for your soul right now. I want to tell you something. The devil comes to church. Did you know that? Well, pastor, I don't believe the devil can be in the same place as the Holy Ghost. Well, you need to read Job. Satan himself went right into heaven. Are you hearing me? Read your Bible. The devil went right into heaven right before the throne, and started to accuse Job. So if he could not be in the same presence as God was, what's he doing in heaven? The very place that we go by faith. He travels there and goes there. Don't listen to some of this Pentecostal jargon that goes around. It's not, it, some of it's stupid. Fall from your own steadfastness. You can fall from your own steadfastness. In other words, you're all on fire for God. You pray. 
You speak in tongues. You've got the gifts of the Spirit. You've got everything that God has given you. And all of a sudden, slowly but surely, as you start neglecting those things, what happens? You begin to fall from your steadfastness. I've had people that were filled with the Holy Spirit tell me they no longer believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They no longer believe in being filled with the Holy Ghost. What happened? The Bible says, let no man deceive you with vain words and philosophies and ideologies of men. What happened? You fall from your own steadfastness. I want us to look for a moment in 1 Samuel. First Samuel 15, starting with verse 1. Samuel was a prophet of God. Everyone agree with that? Everyone believe that Samuel was a prophet? All you could do is read the Bible. He was a prophet of God. God used him to speak into people's lives. God used Samuel to bring direction, instruction, and correction, and to encourage. Read verse 1 here. It says, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to what? To anoint you king over his people, over Israel. So we understand that Saul was called by God. We understand that Saul was anointed by God. And that Saul was going to be used by God. He had the call of God. He had the anointing of God, and he was going to be used by God. Amen? All of our aspirations, we all want that. We want to be anoint, called, we want to be anointed, and we want to be used, right? Don't you want to be used by God? Amen. But he gave him an admonition with that mandate. He said, now, therefore, I always say this, what's the therefore, therefore? Now, therefore, what has been previously said. Samuel came, says, the Lord has anointed you to be king over his people. I've come to give you that call, give you that mandate. Now, therefore, what was the one criteria that he had to do in order to fulfill that call? to fulfill the anointing and the usefulness of God. What was the, th what the, the thing he had to do? Come on, somebody. He had to listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. If you want to be anointed, if you want to be called, if you want to be used, you got to listen to the word. Amen? You've got to listen to what God says versus what you think. You've got to listen to what God says rather than what you know. You've got to listen to what God, who knows everything. That's why he says, listen to my voice. Hear me. Hear what I have to say. Hear what I have to say. Because what I have to say is going to be different than what the world says. God's ways are not the world's ways. That's why you cannot, you cannot fashion yourself according to the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. If you want to be like the world, you cannot be, the, the love of the Father is not in you. She don't bother me. Not at all. I love little babies crying. She's just saying, hallelujah, preach, brother. And so here we have Samuel, the prophet, making a call on a, on a man who's been appointed king, anointed. 
Can I tell you that there are a lot of preachers today that are not anointed, and that doesn't mean it makes you feel good. It makes you, ooh, 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 hallelujah. That doesn't, that's not anointing. That's feelings. One of the proofs I have of anointing is when people get something from a man of God, sometimes they get a little bit upset. Sometimes they get a little angry. Sometimes they don't like what the preacher, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, all the times you've seen us. Men don't like to hear what God has to say because it goes against what they want. Hello? I can hear the crickets. He said in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, now he's given him the word of God. He gave him the call of God. He gave him the anointing of God. Now he's going to speak to him because he said, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Listen. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. How many know that God don't forget? You've been mistreated, been lied about, been talked about, been accused. And you're innocent. You haven't done what people say you've done. The Lord remembers. Amalek. The nation and the people, when the people of Israel were delivered out of Egypt, they were on their way to freedom. They were the ones that were there ready to attack them and kill them. You'll find it in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verse 14. Put that up there for me. And the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Now, this is God speaking, right? Huh? Okay, I'm glad you're with me. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. When you, when you see that phrase, under heaven, that means on the earth. What did God's decree say? What did it say? God said, I'm going to utterly take out the whole lineage, the whole genealogy of Amalek. I'm taking it out of the world, out of the earth. I'm going to do that because they wanted to kill my people. So what's God's will? What was God's will? Come on, participate with me. What was God's will? God's will was to kill all the Amal Amal Am Amalek people, right? Wasn't that God's will? Come on, don't be afraid. I'm not going to bite you. It's his will to destroy a whole family that came against Israel. He said, wipe them out. Didn't he? Now go. Now watch this. Look at verse 7 in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. But Saul, say, here's a conjunction but that makes the difference. But Saul, let me back up a little bit. Okay, let's go to verse 3. It says, And go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that he have. And what? 
spare not. But slay who? The men and the men and who? Uh oh, and the and the baby. Now wait a minute. This is the God of the Bible. See, now some people may be watching this and say, "Well, how can that? How can God be a loving God?" And He's saying to wipe them out. We only see through a glass darkly. We only see what we see. And we look upon a people and we see them and say, oh, God loves everybody. Is, don't we hear that today? God loves everybody. Then if God loves everybody, then how come he said go kill Amalek? Kill the men, the women, the babies. The suckling, the ox, the sheep, the camels, the ass, everything they own, kill it. There's a spiritual lesson for us in the natural. Some of us have some of the Amalek still in us. What is the Amalek spirit? It's a disobedient spirit. Come on. Look what happened. And so Saul, verse 4, gathered the people together, numbered them, numbered them and tell them, and 200,000 footmen, wow, 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For he showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of, out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amal Amalekites. So there were those who were innocent back in the time when Amalek wanted to kill the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. How many know God remembers the good and the bad? He does. So he remembered them and had them removed. Just like the rapture of the church. When God's wrath is poured out upon this earth, he's going to remove the church. And Saul smote, look at verse 7, the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And verse 8, look at this. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Was the king a man? Didn't God say kill all the men and women? He didn't, he didn't say qualify them by positions. He said go kill them. But Saul brought the king alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. And Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep What? He spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. We see what kind of leader he was. Now, before you go judge poor old Saul, there are some of us here this morning, some are listening by Facebook. You have some Amaleks in your life. God's been telling you to destroy those things that are destroying you, the things that want to take you out, the things that have been attacking you. And God says, kill it. Put it to death. Get it out of your life. 
and yet we let it live. Ooh, it's quiet in here. Come on. See, you're hanging on to things that are meaningless, empty, and have no forbearing in your life. You'll never grow. You'll never mature. You'll never develop if you hang on to those things in your life that were part of your past. See, because God wants obedience rather than sacrifice. So we see the story. We go on. We read the story, right? He, he didn't destroy everything that he was supposed to. So Saul's all happy now. He's got the king. He's got all the good things. He, he brought all the good stuff. He got all of the best sheep and all the best oxen and, you know, the lambs and everything else, the fatlings and all that. He got the best of that. What was the purpose of Saul? Why did he want to do that? Well, his excuse was he wanted to use those animals as a sacrifice to the Lord. You cannot offer anything to God that's unholy. You cannot offer anything in your life from your former life. Hello. Why? Because you need to be called, you need to be anointed, and you need to be available. Can't use the old life. That's why I can't, I can't be a nightclub entertainer and be a Christian. I can't go in the bars and stop playing music and seeing people dancing, drinking, doing sexual moves on the dance floor and call myself a Christian. I can't even, I don't even understand how they call these Christian actors that are in Hollywood. And they lay in a bed with a naked woman and they say, well, it's only acting. I ran into one time in, I forget where it was. I think it was Boston, where a stripper they used to strip on in the in the in the combat zone. She said, "I strip for Jesus." So I go there. I take my clothes off. Get me all the men. You know, they all look at me and stuff. And then after, I go there and I hand out tracks. It's a Christian stripper. I'm telling you, the mixing of the world and the mixing of the things of of Christianity today. Is an, it's an abomination to God. Watch. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the corn, I mean, the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, they destroyed utterly. What was that? Partial obedience. Are you hearing me? Partial obedience. Partial obedience. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, the prophet, saying this. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me. So partial, disobe partial obedience... God looks at partial obedience as turning your back on him. Come on. Linda said, if I do partial obedience, I get partial blessing. That's right. It repenteth me that I have made Saul be king. He turned back from following me. Partial obedience, God looks at you are backsliding. If you're being partially obedient, you're backslidden. And hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. You think it's fun to be a pastor, to preach? the right and the truth, 
because people leave the church. I have had people leave the church for over stupidest things. But he didn't shake my hand. He don't love me. He didn't shake my hand Sunday. I, I, I said the, sh the chair should have been red and he bought blue. I'm leaving the church. He hurt my feelings. I'm leaving the church. They don't count all of the 99,000 things that were done right. But they look and say, he hurt me, so I'm leaving the church. What was Samuel's reaction when God told him that? He said, all right, Lord, yeah, praise God. You're going to get him out of the ministry. Yeah, so I, I, you made a mis you know, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. I sh you know, you, it repents you, God, that you didn't want to do this, and, and now you're sorry you did it. No, what was his reaction? It says he cried all night before the Lord. You know, I look at some of your lives. I was here Saturday afternoon. I was right here at this altar. And my heart was breaking for some of you. Some of them are not even here today. Stop trying to figure out who they are, too. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him in the place, and he gone and passed on, and he went down to Gilgal, and Samuel came to Saul and said this, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. That's what Saul said. He, he counted partial obedience as obedience. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He was happy and proud that what he did. Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. If you're telling me you're, you've, you've, you've done the commandment of the Lord, why am I hearing these animals sound? So in other words, there was visibility. Hear me now. There was actual visual proof of his disobedience. Watch this. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people, he blamed the people. God didn't tell the people. God told Saul to kill the men, the women, the children, everybody, the sheep, the oxen, the fatling. He told Saul to do that. And now here he is blaming something else. Don't we so easily shift the blame to something else? When the Lord said something to you one day and said, go speak to that person, and you said, oh, I can't because they, they might get offended. You know what you're saying when you, when you say that to God? You're saying, God, in my foresight, I have better foresight than you. I know what they're going to do before you do. So I'm not going to do that. Really? You know what God's going to do ahead of time? I spoke to a guy at work the other day. And I said, uh, you know the future? He said, yeah. I said, here, write down the Powerball number for me, will you? Watch it. Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Partial obedience. The rest we have destroyed. So see, God, you're going to accept us because we were partially obedient. We, you know, we, 
we, we took only the best of what they had, and we, and we destroyed the, you know, the bad pots. It's like Christians saying, well, we don't smoke, drink, and have sex out of marriage and do all the kind of crazy things that the world does, so we're okay now. We're good. What about truth on the inward parts? That's what God's concerned about. What about truth on the inward parts? What are some of the things that you, you desire and you think about and that you want that's apart from the will of God? What about that? Pastor, you're reading my mail again. I'm not reading your mail. I don't even know your post office box. God does. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stay, and I will tell you what the Lord hath said to me this night. And Saul said, Say on. Oh, he got another word for me. I don't you like those people who always want a word from God? Uh, God's got a word for me. Okay, great, Sam. Oh, Sam, man, you got a, you got a word for me? All right, I was obedient in this word. God, you're going to give me another word? Okay, I'm ready for the word. You're going to bless me. I know he's going to bless me for my obedience, ain't he? He's going he gonna to bless me because, because you know, I, I was obedient. I, I, I killed those people and stuff. You know, he's going he gonna to bless me. He wanted a word. Be careful what you ask for. If you're saying, well, Pastor, these, this is kind of rough. I can't take this kind of word. I need another, I need another church. <clears throat> well, there's a church down the road. Okay, you can go to. It's, it's, it, the pastor is Dr. Willie Feelgood. Maybe you should try there. Dr. Willie Feelgood. You want to feel good. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to make you feel and know that God has a word to speak into your life. And it's all good. It's not bad. It's good. Because if it can get you to change your heart and change your mind toward God and get right on fire for God again, praise God. And Samuel said to Saul, stay, I will tell you what the Lord said to me. And he said, okay, man, say on. And Samuel said, when thou was little in thy own sight, when you were little, when you had humility, when you were humble, no one knew your name. No one called you out. No one didn't even know who you were. You were little in your own sight. Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord set thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. What's the change in the church today? We welcome in sinners. Read Psalm 1. The sinners are not to stand in the congregation of the Lord. Hello? You say, well, then, well, how are they going to get saved? Well, they're going to get saved when you go out and tell them about Jesus. You don't need to bring them to church to get saved. Show me in the Bible anywhere where one of the saints of God led somebody to Jesus in the church. It's not there. They were out in the world. Jesus didn't say, stay in the church and preach the gospel. Is that what he said? No. He said, go ye into all the world. Go out into the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say bring them into the church. Once they get saved, they'll want to come to church. When, I, when my neighbor came over and told me about Jesus, and I bowed my heart and gave my heart to Jesus, the first thing I said to him was, what church do you go to? I want to go to your church. 
Second thing I said is, I want a Bible. Take me, where do you buy Bibles? I don't know where to buy a Bible. He said, you go to the bookstore. I said, will you take me to the bookstore? He said, yeah. I said, let's go. Let's go get a Bible. What happened when I got saved? There was a desire to be in God's house. There was a de- Nobody taught me that. He didn't tell me about going to church. He didn't tell me about that. He told me about Jesus. He didn't tell me I had to read the Bible. I already knew as a Christian. I said, I want a Bible. How did I know that? He didn't tell me. The Holy Ghost told me. Because now the Holy Ghost was living inside of me. Look at verse 19. Wherefore thou didst not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord. Oh, my God. I don't want to hear this kind of word. This prophet Samuel preaching to me doom and gloom. I, I don't want that. I don't want to hear that word. That's not from God. God is love and God is, is he, he's, he's a good, good father. Yeah, he is. I, I, I don't want to hear that. And Saul said to Samuel, now listen now. Samuel had a proven record of being right with God. He was a prophet. He spoke things and it came to pass, right? Now here's Saul trying to justify his disobedience. He says, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, God didn't tell him to bring the king of Amalek. He lied. I want you to know the moment you start becoming half obedient is when you begin to be deceived by the enemy. You start to add things to God that God did not say or do. And have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, verse 21, but the people took the spoil. When a leader does not live up to their responsibilities, he cannot blame the people. A true leader will take the responsibility and say, no, it was my fault. And I believe that if Saul really would have had a repentive heart, if he would have really said, no, God, it wasn't the people, it wasn't all of that, it was my greedy heart, it was was my heart, I didn't obey your word, and God, forgive me, I'll go, let's kill them all. Let's go back and I'll, I'll I'll redo it, Lord. I'm sorry. I believe God would have accepted that. But God knew his heart. And see, that's what happens today with partial obedience. We think that God is still going to accept us. Listen to me. We think that God is still going to accept us with partial obedience. Look what he says. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been, uh, look at this, look, which should have been utterly destroyed. Now he's blaming the people and saying that he was going to do it. They should have been destroyed. He knew they should have been destroyed. But uh uh-oh, now he says, things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. In other words, I can live a Christian life and still do the things in the world, still look like the world, sound like the world, go to the worldly places, and God's going to accept me anyway. That's the same thing the same thing the principle is the same today God says no if any man I'll prove it to you will come after me let him do what huh 
How come Christians don't like to hear that today? Deny yourself. Take up your and for anyone who is not willing to deny himself and take up his cross is accepted partially and we'll deal with them later. Is that what it says? What does it say? He said, Jesus said, the same Jesus you love and serve said this, you are not worthy of me. I'm telling you, people don't like this kind of preaching. They really, really don't. They don't want this kind of preaching, brother. Joe? They don't want the truth. They want to live half-hearted, half-minded, and think all is rosy and all is, oh, everything's fine and dandy. God still loves me, you know, and, and I'm still on my way to heaven shouting glory. You ain't on your way nowhere. Listen. Listen to what he says. And Saul said to Samuel, Yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Man, he's making out the man of God to be a liar. When you leave here and you shake your head and say, I don't believe what pastor said. I only read the word of God to you. You're making me to be a liar. Hello? Well, that's your interpretation. No, it ain't. That's what it says. He says, I have obeyed the Lord's voice and gone the way of the Lord and me and brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed Amalek. But the people took the spoil, always blaming other people and other situations, circumstances, other things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord thy God. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Oh, yeah, you had a nice intention. You, you were going to do it as unto the Lord. You were going to sacrifice these animals. You weren't keeping them for yourself to make money. But is that what God wants? Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? That, what, do you think that God says, you know what? You don't have to obey my voice. Just live the best way you can. Do you think he says that? No, he doesn't. See, Americanized Christianity is so foreign to biblical Christianity. We've got people that say, you know, once you're saved by grace, that's it. You're, you're locked in. You're all set. You don't have nothing to worry about. But people believe the lie. Don't have to do anything. Faith without works is dead, my friend. You say you believe, the devil believes. And then he says this, behold, take notice, take notice. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. You know, God, you're calling me to go to that country. I can't go there. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you $5,000 of my salary every year toward that country. How's that, God? Okay, God, we got an agreement. We're all set. Good job. No problem. Okay. No, God doesn't accept that. Obey is better than sacrifice. Being obedient to his voice is better than sacrifice. Now watch this. And to hearken them, the fat ram. Now, God's going to pull the mask off. You know, you know when I really don't like dealing with car dealers because they come with a big smile, but you know what they're after. They want your money, right? They want your business. They don't care about you. 
I don't care how much they smile. I don't care how many lollipops they give you, sandwiches they give you, coffee they give you, make you feel at home. They don't care about you. They didn't know you before you walked through that door. They want your business. Look what God said. For rebellion! Not hearing God's, not listening to God's voice and paying attention to what he said and doing what he said is rebellion. Oh, this nation is full of rebellion. Rebellion to authority. With your policemen and your firemen and rebellion in the home. Children against their parents. Rebellion in the schools. Someone ran into a, a, a one of the teachers that had uh, uh, retired. And he retired. He said, you know why? He said, a bunch of animals. He says, you can't control them. They're going wild in high school, junior high school. He said, they're crazy. And if you say anything or do anything, they accuse you of hitting them. He says, for, the re for rebellion is as the sin of... Uh-oh. Now let me ask you a question. Was Saul totally rebellious toward God? Was he? No. He went, he killed some of the Amalekites, didn't he? He was partially obedient. Oh, come on. Some of you know where I'm going with this. He was partially obedient. God still counted it as what? Let's call it what it is. Rebellion. And he said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, that doesn't mean you're in a cellar in a dark place mixing portions and stuff, wearing a green on, green on your face and a big pointed hat. That's not what it's talking about. Did you know that witchcraft is a product of the flesh? Did you know that? What's like the sin of witchcraft? Rebellion. I just read it to you. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Galatians chapter 5 says this. Chapter 5, verse 10. Uh, verse 19, I'm sorry. Galatians 5, 19 says this. Now the works of the flesh are manifested. What kind of works are they? Of the flesh. Adultery, that's normal. Fornication, we understand. When I say that's normal, that's... We understand that to be the flesh. Fornication, uncleanness, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, and witchcraft. Rebellion. And it says those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Now, don't get mad at me now. Please, I, I'm not saying this for anyone on Facebook, or anyone to get mad at me. I'm, I'm giving you the what I believe the word of the God, the word of the Lord is from my heart to you. And stubbornness. You know anybody stubborn? How many here know st someone that's stubborn? Raise your hand. Anyone else you know? Huh?
Nobody pointed at themselves. Oh, you, you still did? Oh, ourselves? Huh? Can we be stubborn? Let's see what God thinks about that. Can we see what God thinks about that? Look what he says. Look. And stubbornness is as the iniquity of idolatry. So if you're a stubborn person, stop talking about the Catholics worshiping idols because you do the same thing with your opinion. Your opinion becomes your idol and you become stubborn. I'm not going to listen to him. Who does he think he is? You're not listening to me. I'm talking about the Word of God. You don't want to. You don't want to be obedient to the word of God. That's your problem. <clears throat> Nobody's going to tell me I can't drink. No one's not going to tell me that I can't smoke a little marijuana and be a Christian. No one's going to tell me I can't. I can't uh, smoke cigarettes and be a Christian. No, you can be a Christian and do all those things. But are you a biblical Christian? I hear people all the time cry, Oh, Pastor, I got cancer. You got cancer? Yeah. Do you smoke? Yeah. I smoke. Now, after you found out you have cancer, did you stop? <laughs> no. I'm going to die anyway. Hello? What's the Bible say? If you are a Christian, your body is not your own. Stop doing to your body what you want to do. That's rebellion. That's stubbornness. You've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That's what the Bible says. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you destroy that temple, God says, I will destroy you. And he's talking to the church. Oh, God, where's the preachers and the real prophets to speak his word? Where are they? You won't hear too many of them. I'm telling you, listen to what I'm telling you right now. Judgment is coming on America like you have never seen before. You're going to see things, you're going to see things that's going to be multiplied. You're going to see greater earthquakes, greater hurricanes, greater tornadoes, greater devastation greater sicknesses and diseases that are going to be poured out on this nation because God's judgment's coming. And if you don't think so, let me tell you this. Sodom and Gomorrah only had one preacher telling them what was right and what was wrong. America has millions upon millions upon millions of Bibles. We have radio programs, morality being taught. Radio, it's all over the place. And if Sodom had no Bible and God judged them, what's going to be the judgment for America? Leonard Ravenhill said that. Stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry, because you rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. He rejects you, Saul, from being called, anointed, and sent. And he's calling you to not be stubborn or rebellious because in that is witchcraft and idolatry. Look at verse 24, and I'm going to close. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord 
and the words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. What's holding you back from living right with God? Friends? Peer pressure? What do your work, you know, your work friends are going to say? What's holding you back? Are you fearful of what people are going to think about you? Are you fearful that people are going to label you a Christian fanatic? And so you hold back. And then verse 25, now therefore I pray thee, I know I was going to end, but I'm sorry. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. He never was restored. Out of that, listen to me, out of that, David was anointed king. And what did Saul try to do to David? Kill him. Kill him. He wanted to destroy all of the people of obedience that God had called and anointed because he lost out. Brother Bob, play something. I've given you this word today because as we've been saying and hearing, God's come, Jesus is coming soon. And I didn't read it, but I was, I was going to read it in first, I believe it's first Peter says, the scoffers say, when is he coming? You've been saying that from the very beginning of time. You know, he's, he's coming. They scoff and they laugh and they say, we've been saying that for all these years. No man knows when he's going to come. It's like, you know when you're home and you know your house is a mess? I mean, the only one perfect house I've ever seen, it's like that all the time, it's Vicky's house. You can go to Vicky's house anytime and eat off the floor. She should have a house cleaning seminar on how to clean. I mean, somebody mentioned it to me the other day. She says, man, I've never been in a clean house like that in my life. She said, everything's clean. Door jams, everything. And it's true. She, that woman knows how to clean a house. But let's say, you know, how many, how many live that way? We, a lot of us don't live that way. I don't live that way. We've got things hanging around and all kinds of stuff, you know, all over the place and everything. You know, but, you know, suppose you have a big mess in your house and you hear a knock on the door. And somebody's going to come and visit. What's the first thing you do? Wait a minute. You're running around trying to fix everything, get everything at least halfway decent. Come on. It's the truth, right? But when Jesus comes, you ain't going to have time to run around and get things right. There ain't going to be enough time for you to run around. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now's the accepted time. Now's the time to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. I prayed this message on Facebook right now in Jesus' name. Put that down, please, a little bit. I pray right now for the people on Facebook. If you heard this message, I challenge you today to repent, get right with God. Don't be rebellious and stubborn any longer. Turn your life over to Christ. 100% follow Jesus. Don't follow the fads. Don't follow the, the trends that are going out there in Christianity. Follow Jesus Christ. Hear his voice and be obedient to his voice. Now, Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that everyone here that heard this message will receive it, believe it, apply it, and do it. 
I'm not going to ask them to come forward, Lord. But every head bow now, every eye closed, come on. If you say, Pastor, this message has touched some area of my heart, just lift your hand and put it back down so I can pray for you. One, thank you. God bless you. Two, God bless you. Three, four, five, six. God bless you. Seven, eight, nine. God bless you. Ten, God bless you. Anyone else? Eleven, God bless you. Father, in the name of Jesus, for those who raise their hands, I pray, Lord God, that you will, by your spirit, impregnate them with your word and let them walk in obedience. And Father, if there be any rebellion that consist, consistently shows its ugly head, I pray that you would reveal it and that you would deal with it. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for anyone's salvation, Lord. I pray, God, that they, if they need you, Lord, they will turn their hearts back to you, Father. They will repent of their sins. I thank you and I praise you for this word this morning. I thank you for your arrangement this morning. That God is not as it's not church as usual. And Lord, I pray, have your way. In our hearts, in our lives, in our homes, in our schools, in our churches. We thank you, Father. I pray your blessing to be upon everyone, Lord. From the crown of their heads to the sole of their feet, from their lying down to their rising up, for their going in and coming out, I pray, pray, Father, you bless them today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, God bless you.